most, I do want to welcome everyone today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of our very busy schedules. I know going into the holiday week next week, um, but Rise and Set Summit, we're here. We do these twice a year, so usually in the springtime, usually in the fall time. Um, so this is the, the second one we're doing for 2021. And again, thank you everyone that has joined um, Rise and Set for those of you that have not joined one of these before is really a, a real an opportunity for us as an agency generator as a whole to really gather with our client teams our, our partner teams and just anyone within our universe that we can really gather together and talk about different industry topics trends practical examples really really anything that's occurring externally that may affect the way that we do our all of our work on a daily basis so uh, just a quick note on some housekeeping items. Uh, we are using Microsoft Teams. Uh, so there are some controls that you guys should be aware of. So on the very top or bottom of your screen, you should see a little comment bubble. That comment bubble, uh, you can chat with me. I'm currently monitoring all of those chats that come in. So if you do have any questions for our panel as we go through today, feel free to throw in any, any comments or any questions that you may have. And we'll be either introducing those into the conversation as we go, or we'll be saving them for our QA portion at the end, which we have about 10 minutes currently slated uh, for questions just towards the end of that. Also, you'll see a little emoji, little smiley face there with a hand if you have that. That is just for some reactions. So if you're wanting to show our panel a little bit of love, give them a little bit of applause or a heart and things that they're saying, uh, feel free to use that as you wish. Um, they will be able to see those, those interactions. So without further ado, I think we should get started. Um, panel, how are we feeling? How are we doing today? You all look great. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. So I want to start off with some, <laughs> we want to start off with some introductions. So my name is Adam Ortman. I'm a VP of Growth and Innovation here at Generator. Um, I'm moderating today. So the brilliant brains that you have in front of you on our panel, uh, I will have them introduce themselves. Crystal, if you want to start us off today, just giving us a little bit about yourself, your experience and some of the work that you work on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm Crystal Richards. I am one of the uh, communication strategy director here at Generator Media. I joined Generator back in April um, with about 10 years of experience um, in media, particularly in the uh, consumer packaged goods world with a little sprinkle of pharmaceuticals, government and retail. Um, but um, really throughout my time within the CPG world, just focused a lot on um, kind of just like the, the full funnel approach in terms of um, driving that brand. And so uh, this is a topic that I'm very passionate about and excited to be speaking about today. Thank you so much, Crystal. We're very happy to have you not only on the team, but on the panel today. So thank you very much. Ryan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ryan Chan. Um, I've been at Generator Media for a little over three years. Um, in my time here, I have worked on um, several different uh, accounts, um, but, um, you know, in, in my past, I've really focused on um, a number of different overarching verticals. So whether it be travel, ver um, gaming, consumer technology, um, just uh, a little bit of everything. So I'm um, really happy to be here just because I think this overall topic um, is something that comes up um, and creates a lot of really great conversation. Uh, a lot of not only conceptual, but also very quantitative um, discussions really come into play. And, um, you know, there there's never a perfect answer because um, there's always just so much to really factor in. But uh, it's an important conversation for every single brand and every single agency to really have. Perfect. Thank you so much. And Aaron, tell us a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Hi, I'm Erin Kelly. I am a communication strategy director here at Generator. I have about eight years of experience in the media industry. And really, my sweet spot has been in CPG, particularly food portfolio brands. Um, I also went to the dark side, the client side, um, and pharmaceuticals before <laughs> coming over to Generator. So, um, yeah, here at Generator, I work on multiple different verticals, including education, gaming, and CPG. But just really excited to be here today and discuss with you. Perfect. Well, thank you all again so much. And again, thank you to our audience who's taking time out of, time out of their day just to, just to listen to some of the things that we have to say. <clears throat> and that leads us really to our topic today. So there's a lot of iteration, a lot of brainstorming around topics and themes that are important to us, not only as marketers and advertisers, but also as consumers. Um, 
thinking about what would really impact going into 2022. Um, this idea of branding versus performance media is actually a topic that I personally have have worked with, have had questions to me about over my 13 years in, in the media space. And I feel like it's a common, common thread across different brands, different categories, and, and really different sizes of campaigns. So we are wanting to bring these, like I said, brilliant generators to you today to really have a deep dive discussion about how can brands really identify what is that perfect mix and why is that mix important? So obviously we've done a lot of, of um, brainstorming and conversations leading up to this time, but I do want to kick it off with Crystal. Just for you and your experience, um, knowing that you have big brand experience, smaller brand experience, why is this topic specifically important to you and why should we be talking about it today? Yeah, um, so for me, um, specifically, I think there's definitely been a shift in the industry more recently in the, in the last few years. And so I had taken a year off to kind of travel and uh, prior to doing that, I was working on brands that were really heavily focused within the uh, brand equity kind of building space. And so I came back and um, as I was meeting with different teams, um, everyone was like, performance media, performance media, DR. And I was just like, okay, this is great, but is this all everyone is talking about now? Like uh, what happened to the need to form those connections, to build those brand love? And it seemed as if there was just more of a shift as opposed to, okay, Yes, this is definitely um, something that we should do because there's so much data greater out there, um, great data out there from a just conversion standpoint and just driving those sales. Um, but then also, how do we just broaden that up so that we can help to start to like help future proof our business by bringing these awareness and consideration tactics into the fold? And so um, I think for me, um, coming back into the industry is definitely understanding and seeing from the past where um, these consideration tactics, awareness tactics really help to form these really strong connections with consumers um, and the need to continuously do that. One, um, just to continue to have that kind of consumer loyalty, but then also uh, to grow that that and feed that funnel that will actually lead to those sales on the lower um, on the lower end of the funnel. Perfect. Perfect. And well, firstly, I'm very jealous of your year off traveling. Um, it was nice and you should be. <laughs> <laughs> was i'm sure it was i'll need to have some more stories out of you when we get drinks next but aaron how do how do you feel about this topic and how has how have you seen this topic arise throughout your career thus far yeah i think a lot of brands struggle with this topic um because they get a lot of pressure from leadership just kind of between the balance of immediate sales goals versus the long-term longevity and growth of a brand um, and I'm often seeing clients being tasked to do both with not infinite budgets. Um, so we get the question a lot with how do I prioritize or how do I allocate? And I do think that there are some frameworks here that can be applied, but it really is no one size fits all. It really is dependent on the brand. Um, a lot of different factors like how mature the brand is, how mature the market is, the purchase cycle, pricing, competition, creative, you name it. Um, and that kind of coupled with the fact that there's new media touch points in tech coming out, which seems like every minute. Um, so I do think that it's going to be just this kind of ever present topic. Um, and really it's our job as our media, as your media partners to like help our clients evaluate those individual circumstances for your brands and provide that recommendation for what we think will best perform for the brand. Um, so long story short, I think there's just so many changing factors always that it's going to be that consistent question that we get. Perfect. And I couldn't agree more because, you know, as I said in the beginning, I feel like in some instance, every brand has this type of question, right? So how do we balance the efficiency and the, the volume of a DR tactic versus that storytelling, that brand love that Crystal was speaking about? So that's fantastic. And Ryan, I know, I know you have kind of a, a sprinkling of categories throughout your career. So I'm really interested in, in why this topic is important to you. Yeah, I mean, I think both uh, Crystal and Aaron uh, brought up excellent points in general. So, um, you know, to Crystal's point, I think because conversion uh, in performance-oriented media, as well as the proliferation of digital media in general, um, 
there's just such a wealth of data available to really track sales and get an understanding exactly of where sales are coming from. So, um, and to Aaron's point, uh, there's there's a really strong temptation to focus on uh, sales and conversions just because it's a currency that's most um, easily understood and easiest to quantify. But, um, you know, unfortunately, real life just isn't quite so simple. So, um, you know, depending on the category, um, it, it really, really changes the overall um, sort of pathway that consumers really take. But um, I think when there's that sort of disproportionate focus on conversions, uh, there's a tendency to really think that the consumer path to purchase is point A to point B. But in reality, it starts ending up becoming closer to a really complex like spider web almost where um, there are a number of brand touch points that take place even before a consumer is even starting to research his or her overall purchase before they even understand what they're really looking for. So, um, you know, while conversion strategies do play an important role to solicit action and yield results, uh, awareness and consideration allow brands to really scale out tactics that uh, drive high conversion rates. So, you know, being able to actually lead to brand growth, which, uh, you know, is just as important to something as uh, direct sales. So, um, and I think regardless of the category, um, it's an important conversation, but especially as you start to start thinking about uh, along the lines of how highly involved a decision is making uh, based on the brand product, um, it becomes an increasingly more fascinating and complex uh, answer as it comes to it. Perfect. And do you have any ex examples that you've had in your past where this was a really prominent topic or theme or conversation that you've had with clients? Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't mention this in uh, my list before, but uh, I, I've spent some time in the the auto industry, and you know, of course, purchasing a car is very different than purchasing a, a pack of gum, right? Because uh, a pack of gum, you literally go into the uh, the the impulse aisle and you purchase it just based on you know having a feeling in the pit of your stomach or a feeling in your mouth that you want a, a different taste. It's something that's very very um, you know just reactionary, whereas Purchasing something like a car or even like something like consumer tech, it involves months, if not even maybe even closer to years of research that's involved. So because of that, uh, you know, it's it's a conversation where there is a tendency, again, to really focus on sales and the bottom line. But in order to really feed that bottom line, you, you need to make sure that you're at the table um, when it comes time for a consumer to even start the research process. So, uh, you know, understanding the different metrics, the different sort of benchmarks that you need to hit in order to ensure that, you know, when it comes down to actually influence an overall decision and get in front of the right person at the right time with the right message, that you're something that, or you're a brand that the consumer actually recognizes and feels comfortable with and links to, you know, what they're actually looking for. Yeah. And Ryan really brought up a, a great point just in terms of the car versus gum. And of course, there's definitely that price point difference that causes that um, longer consumer journey. Um, but I think that there's also something to be said about um, in that same vein, the things that have like an emotional connection or a functional connection that a gum just doesn't evoke the same thing. And so if you are a brand where um, someone is going to um, be looking for um, any type of um, emotional connection, like if you are, say, for example, like a gym, um, a gym is more than function. It's functional, yes, in the sense that you're doing it to um, really improve your health or to gain a certain body image. Um, but there is also, in the famous words of Elwood from Legally Blonde, like exercise, <laughs> um, exercise makes you happy and um, and gives you an, and endorphins give um, exercise give you endorphins and endorphins make you happy. So there's also that emotional connection. So um, for us um, as marketers and just in a whole in the industry, it's kind of understanding also like is there that need from a consumer standpoint because I think if we put that consumer lens on like we will never lose so is it um, a place where you're saying this consumer needs more than just this con con um, conversion tactic this consumer needs for us to build these authentic connections um, they need for us to um, to speak to them differently and so I think that that's also something to put in that um, goes into that consideration in terms of um, brand building versus that performance media. Mm -hmm. So we're really just talking now and, and the both of you are making my moder my moderating job really easy because you're you're kind of naturally taking us to our next point, which are just some of the tentpole items that we 
tend to look at as marketers for why why branding versus performance. And Ryan and, and Crystal, you guys have just brought up one of our main points, which is really understanding a, a, the client's product or service and understanding how consumers interact with that product and service from a perspective perspective and how long that timeline is from initial handshake to ultimate purchase and so crystal you did a great job of just you know bringing up the the um you know going after the the excuse me the car versus versus another another item and pack of gum those are very different purchase cycles right so a person may be standing in line at the grocery store impulse buying gum have having no emotional connection to it where crystal to your point there's a lot of affinity that goes into purchasing a car so for example like um safety and other and other items so aaron anything that you have in your experience you know with existing work or even in your past that really solidifies and concretes this idea of how a different customer journey may lead to different forms of branding and performance mixes when you're talking about a campaign mix. Yeah, I can give a few examples here um, based off my past life. So uh, I was working on a consumer packaged good food portfolio back in the day, and it was right when programmatic media like first came out. And so we saw this really big shift um, with their competitive set and with our brands of pulling dollars out of TV and shifting it all into programmatic media because it was this kind of shiny, new, really hyper-targeted tactic, um, which sounded really great, and it is great. But eventually we started to see our sales decline, not only for our brands, but also for our competitive brands um, too. And what we really kind of saw was the degradation of this top of mind awareness um, because a product like a popcorn, you know, it isn't really highly researched. It's not super complicated. You're not really going to the brand.com to purchase um, or convert. And we kind of saw that we, we swung way too far down into the trenches of this like performance space. And so what we really needed was more of this appropriate mix of brand building to set ourselves apart from like the two to three competitors in the space with the appropriate amount of performance to capture those in-market consumers and appropriate channels like e-commerce, et cetera. So um, I like to use this analogy uh, that kind of compares branding to planting seeds and performance to harvesting. And it's a lot of like, you have to plant the seeds if you wanna to continue to harvest. Like if you want to fill the funnel um, so that you can convert, you have to build this brand awareness first. Um, so that's kind of how I saw it in the CPG space, but kind of on the inverse, uh, for industries like education, let's say um, let's say you're a well-established brand and you have a leaned-in consumer, um, you may not necessarily need to spend dollars in brand building um, to keep top of mind for the masses um, and really just kind of focus on using the data and intent signals to convert prospective students where they are. So I think, you know, in that ed education example, kind of given your industry and past investments in branding, you kind of have this fresh crop refilling your funnel so you don't have to do all of that hard work. But I think it all just, again, kind of depends on the brand, the industry, everything that we've been talking about um, to kind of find that correct mix. Nice. And Ryan, I, I, saw, you, I saw you smile at the, the planting versus harvesting. Do you agree with that type of mentality? Yeah, I 100% agree. I just love analogies in general, and I, I love that one in particular. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think the only thing that I'd, I'd really just add, and it's more so just echoing uh, Aaron's sentiments. But um, you know, uh, we any marketer really is under understands the the concept of like the purchase funnel of like awareness, consideration, and conversion. Um, but ultimately, um, I think another way to really think about it too is just that you know if you flip that funnel over and you have like a, a triangle, the awareness media, uh, awareness in general is basically the foundation. It's at the bottom. It's the biggest portion of it. And that's the way that I feel marketers and agencies should really have an understanding of awareness, consideration and um, conversion is that, you know, once you start chipping away at that foundation, um, it becomes so much more difficult to really uh, get to the top of that pyramid and um, get uh, start converting those those prospects, because the more you take away again from the funnel the less that really is able to go down and um that you're able to influence moving forward if, like if people haven't 
heard of your product, aren't familiar with um, the, the offerings that it has, then you know what are the chances that they're really going to actually take action and, uh, and trial out? Sure, sure. Crystal, anything else to add? Um, we covered a lot, so. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, definitely um, just piggybacking off Ryan's point in that pyramid, and then just at the top with flipping that pyramid at the top, looking at conversion. I think sometimes it's like too laser focused on that part um, with the conversion. And then we um, really miss out on so many other great opportunities to um, to build these relationships with consumers. Um, and then also just looking at kind of like where is the brand? marketplace like if you're solely focused on conversion tactics but your competitor is out shouting you like 10 to 1 like before they can even before you can even reach them with that conversion tactic they've already been messaged to 10 to, uh, nine times by um, your competitors so I think it's also um, not being so laser focused on it but then also kind of like stepping back and just looking at that landscape from that consumer perspective but then also um from the competitive um space just to make sure that your competitors aren't reaching them before you do sure sure and i, and I love that idea of the, the whole landscape because i think when brands do get hyper focused in on these on these performance metrics, sales, 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 they do kind of lose focus of what is the bigger picture going on within their category, um, and that leads me this idea of a landscape leads me to really our next topic, which is, you know, these types of conversion funnels exist across every brand. They're unique to every brand, but those those consumer funnels, those consumer journeys, may exist. In client with clients in different client life stages, right? So we may have a startup brand versus a brand that's been, you know, that has reached maturation 35 plus years in business. Um, so Crystal, since you were just talking about that landscape piece, how does a client's life stage or a brand's life stage work in this theme, and why is why is the 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 maturity level of that brand? In, in its existence important to the branding versus performance conversation. Yeah, and I think this part is um, is kind of um, clear. So I think most marketers is, are you in a new emerging or established category? And so uh, sometimes you are in a new category and you are essentially creating that category and you can be strictly conversion based, um, especially if you're a brand that's um, fully DTC, like um, that's something that you can own. Um, and then if you are more of an established brand, again, um, you may not need to do all of that awareness tactic because um, consumers already know you. If anything, awareness is more top of mind versus true like awareness. And so I think it, um, again, um, it's not a one size fits all, but understanding that where you are on that life stage, how, what does that space look like for you? Do you have competitors? What is your price point? So it's really triangulating all of those different points um, to get to that right mix because it's not just awareness focus at all like it's definitely a mix of everything and so understanding what is that mix and then evolving that mix because if this year I focus 50% of my marketing dollars on awareness next year I may not I, I likely don't need to do that I can drop down to 20 excuse me to 40% or 35% um, so it's also just that continuous evolution of that and understanding that it's not a set amount it's I'm um, really just dependent on um, what you're seeing from a from a from an angle perspective. Perfect, perfect. And, and Aaron, I know that you and I have had some really good conversation yeah. about some of the some of the work that you've seen in the past with some of the mature brands that you've worked with. Give us a little bit about how you see client life stage as being an important item in this topic. Yeah, and I love examples. So again, I'll give you one. Um, I worked on a brand, again, a food brand, that was well-established um, with their consumer base, but had little awareness kind of with these more prospective consumers. Um, the strategy that we kind of would activate for the brand was really sales focused. It was more of a buy rate strategy, more like performance driven, um, and they kind of had a smaller budget. Um, really, we just wanted the consumer to buy like one more can and then we'd be good for our business KPIs, which was great, but you know, it wasn't really future proofing the brand for us. Um, the brand had an older target audience and our consumers were really just aging out. And so 
we collectively as a marketing team decided, you know, we need a new source of growth, a new consumer group to tap into. Um, so what we started to do really is start, you know, it, it's a slow process. You start to increase your investments. You still maintain your performance budgets, but you start to introduce some of these branding elements like maybe Spot TV in a few markets or OTT. Um, for this instance, we came out with a new like creative campaign um, that was geared slightly towards a slightly younger audience. Um, and we stair-stepped our way kind of into that for like two to three years. It wasn't this dramatic shift of pull all your dollars out of what's working, but kind of let's gradually test and learn and get in. Um, and I think what it really does take too is alignment from leadership, your brand teams, all of your agency partners, that this is what the long-term outcome and uh, future of the brand is going to look like and just making these small adjustments as you go. Um, another rule of thumb that I kind of like to use is performance is really to remind a consumer what they already know and you use a lot more brand building when you're trying to drive a consumer to think or feel something new about your brand. And in this instance, we really needed a consumer to think or feel something about our brand because they weren't even aware that that can of stew existed. Um, so, yeah, I think it really is about... Um, understanding how to how to balance while still you know hitting your business kpis and not making dramatic shifts and really kind of test and learning perfect perfect i do want to get back to this test and learn uh, uh, idea but ryan i do want you to have a have you know provide us with your two cents on this client stage item just because again due to your breadth of experience across categories, you've worked on startups, you've worked on established brands. So how do you see that this client life stage item is, is translatable across the types of businesses that you've worked on? Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, when it comes to determining overall media allocations, uh, I think life stage is one of the first factors that you uh, take into account when determining the importance of awareness and consideration versus conversion. And um, I think both Aaron and Crystal made um, very salient points that I agree with. But uh, I think the only thing that I'd really add on to it is just beyond the fact that, you know, it's not one size fits all. It's very dependent on not only the category, but also um, the maturity of the business itself. Um, it's it's vital to really uh, determine appropriate goals, benchmarks, and projections based on where the life stage is. So, um, you know, beyond looking at just media strategy, it's sort of tempering the expectations of what media's role is and uh, what we expect to see out of it. So, you know, depending uh, again on the life stage, uh, it's figuring out what's the right priority. So for, for instance, a completely new brand, um, it would likely be something along the lines of ensuring that people know about the brand and have a grasp on what the fundamental offerings are. Uh, whereas for a relatively new brand that's um, a bit more mature, it's more so the matter of making sure the brand is in the consideration set. So like they have a spot at the table when shoppers are considering uh, what to purchase or you know like what services to go after. And then for something along the lines of more of a mature brand, um, you know, it's more along the lines of maintaining share of attention, but also being able to capitalize on the foundation that you built, you know, um, putting a greater emphasis on performance oriented metrics, but also ensuring that you still have the appropriate share of voice to make sure that you're not forgotten, to make sure that, um, you know, people are still aware of what the overall brand story is and establishing, you know, like the types of connections that Crystal has been mentioning. And, um, you know, it, again, creating the, that overall uh, narrative about um, what it is that you do. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I, I like that idea that you were just mentioning about how awareness can actually be act, can act as a shield against competition. So maintaining your market share, um, maintaining that share of voice when it really matters because we all know that our you know, every brand is looking to gobble up as much of that as possible. Yeah, I mean, if that weren't important, then why would we still see Coca-Cola ads, right? <laughs> that dang polar bear is still doing this thing. Um, all right. So, like I said, I wanted I wanted to bring up this test and learn mentality because I think for many brands who are very dr focused or maybe even mid funnel focused, the idea of going into the upper portions of the funnel may be, you know, hard to grasp. What do I, you know, how do I go about doing this? What are my first steps? Um, and so, Crystal, I'm going to throw this one to you to get us 
kicked off on, but what is this test and learn? And, and if we were to recommend going and investing in upper portions of the funnel beyond performance media, what would we what would we recommend? Yeah, um, so I would think that um, kind of even using a pyramid, but not a pyramid from an actual consumer journey standpoint, but a pyramid from the sense of um, the bottom part of the pyramid being like your tried and true tactic. So like it's that 70, 20, 10, like the 20% is your tried and true tactic, but let's continue to evolve in that space. So if you've always run with Facebook, Facebook is doing well, but um, there's some new uh, third party segments um, that are cookie less that you can use to import into Facebook um, that's in the 20. And then there's this space in like the 10%. And for some brands, it's apps, it could be completely less than that. It could be 5%. Um, but I think it's creating that space for you to continuously evolve and understanding that um, really that 70% um, or 70 to 90% of your budget that's in your proven channels like that is something that's not it's not going to be compromised. Um, it's already shown to work for you. Um, it's kind of like your bread and butter, tried and true media. Uh, but then taking the time to, again, I think test and learn is just also about just um, helping to future proof your business. Um, taking that time to test and um, test smartly. So we used to always say, let's not test for test and sake, even though on some brands we did just because we had a lot of money. <laughs> um, but um, not testing for testing's sake, but to say, okay, we know that there is the cookie Armageddon. Um, how do we start to to combat that in advance of that? Or we know that with iOS update, it's impacted so many things. Um, what can we do um, to to combat that? And I think with that there is also a sense of like these are small goals that we're making we're not just throwing this out we're making sure that they're measurable scalable but then there also has to be like a small little appetite like a little aftertaste like this may not work um but we are okay with this because if it does work it unlocks so much for us um so i think it's understanding that these tests are um being done with a lot of thought um into it and um part of testing is even though you may have a strong um hypothesis that may, hypothesis may not prove out but that doesn't mean that um you can't test again in the future so aaron when we're looking at testing and learning and, and then ultimately scaling if you see that success yeah. How would you recommend budgeting against something, a strategy of, of that sort? Yeah, I think in the past, how we've approached it on a few different brands is just kind of dipping your toe maybe into like select markets too. So you have key focus areas where you can kind of have control and expose to see the impact or, you know, just being on a few network channels instead of having, you know, network syndication um, and broadcast. So kind of taking your bets there um, and then understanding and having a game plan for how you could scale it up uh, to more of like a national approach or additional channels, things like that. But exactly to kind of what Crystal was saying, I think with the testing and learning, um, having clear objectives and KPIs is really important. Um, so one, you can make sure that you can deem it successful or not but also that everybody's just kind of on board with these KPIs because it may not be um, the same as what a client's used to seeing in like the performance space um, and just tempering those expectations to what Ryan was saying earlier too. Like I think with test and learn, everybody has to be on board and to Crystal's point, like there may be an, an opportunity that just doesn't work and that's a great learning for the brand and we can pivot away from that moving forward. So I think those are huge. And then just investing responsibly. Um, you want to go from like spending $10,000 to like $10 million, you know, um, we want to make sure that we have a lot of like the client data in hands to make sure that we could understand, you know, returns and things like that for um, our clients. But yeah, I think the last thing I would just say too, with like testing and learning is just patience, especially with the brand building. Um, it, it does take some time, so you may not see like those immediate results that you're used to seeing in the performance space. Um, so, yeah, overall, I think it's good to kind of choose your battlefield and then just make sure you're in lockstep with your team in terms of outcomes or expectations. Perfect, perfect. And Ryan, any examples that you have in regards to this test and learn mentality that you've seen prove successful or anything else you would like to add on top of um, Aaron or Crystal's comments? Yeah, I mean, I think 
Over the past few years, um, something that's become really an explosion for the, the media landscape has just been influencer media. Um, it's been a vertical and category that's really been on the tip of our tongue for like over a decade. But I think um, just in the past few years, it started to really, um, really round into form at this point. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the big challenges there is that, um, you know, I, I couldn't agree more with what Aaron just mentioned in terms of, again, like tempering expectations and having the right metric for the right tactic, because um, something like testing and learning um, the ever evolving influencer space uh, requires just understanding what sort of metrics you can get your hands on versus what you can. And then um, from there, projecting and determining benchmarks of what is and isn't success, because you would never really expect influencer media to do the same thing as, for instance, branded search. You know, like branded search is where you find people who have already indicated interest in your brand, whereas influencers is where you're actually, um, you know, trying to really cut through the clutter, do something that um, really hits home that people are actually going out of their way to engage with, whereas, um, you know, it, it fulfills a very, very different role, therefore should have sort of a different uh, success metric and benchmark uh, than something within the search space. So um, I think, uh, you know, not only can you serve to um, future-proof your business, but, you know, it creates a lot of opportunity to see success in the current. You know, it, it creates an opportunity to uh, garner efficiency while the pricing of different opportunities still um, – is a bit wishy-washy. It allows for a lot of opportunities to get things at lower values than what they will be in, say, just even a year or two from now. Um, and also, it allows us to, you know, actually test and see what succeeds, and then optimize away from things that, um, you know, don't necessarily hit the metrics that we would anticipate. But um, I, I think the only thing otherwise that I would add is that, you know, while again testing and learning uh, requires creativity, innovation, and you get to have some fun getting off the beaten path. Um, it's really important to again really keep it balanced in data. So something just really needs to be measured in a fair and accurate way to understand the impact the test had. So you know just going into that um, influencer example again, just understanding um, you know what exactly is the metric that you're measuring it based off of. Is it are you creating a separate landing page in order to determine uh, the traffic that is going to it? Um, where are you going to have a coupon code that? an influencer is going to call out and then you can track it separately. Just making sure that, um, again, you have the initial expectations of what you expect to see and, you know, don't try to compare it to something that has just a completely different role. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I, I also love that idea of making sure that you're using the right metric for the right tactic. I think that we often, we often get very caught up in, you know, the sales or the lead or the conversion where there may be a lot of other engagement metrics or other awareness or, or consideration metrics that we could use to also demonstrate impact. Um, so Ryan, you're, you're a data nerd just like I am. We could probably talk about it for the next four hours, which nobody has time for today. But you spoke about some examples which were fantastic, you know, using a specific landing page to measure visits that's coming directly from perhaps an out of home vanity URL, as an example, or looking at coupon code redemptions. Those are fantastic. Any other examples that you've used in your past, whether it's in some of your automotive experience or otherwise, that you've seen where we can tie upper funnel awareness down, down to performance metrics? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, and uh, honestly, I think it's something that I feel goes criminally underutilized as upper funnel, upper funnel um, metrics in general, because, you know, it's, it's easiest to look at things like site visitation and click through rate just because it's the most commoditized. But there's just so much more out there, you know, at, at the top of the hour, Crystal brought up the point that there's just such a a wealth of conversion data that exists out there. But, you know, a lot of the times we, um, as marketers, end up forgetting about a lot of the the tools out there that really exist for uh, awareness and consideration type metrics. So, you know, whether it be something like a brand health study um, that you can customize in order to understand, you know, unaided awareness or where your brand falls um, in its competitive set, but also things like uh, mid funnel and consideration. You could do brand studies in order to understand you know, the linkage that a brand name has to different attributes. So to sort of tie it back to um, automotive, just since that's top of mind since you mentioned it, um, the idea of, um, you know, is a car brand 
linked more so to being um, like a sports car, like fancy, uh, like high horsepower, or is it linked to something like safety? Or, you know, uh, on the other side of the spectrum, is it linked to something like being sort of cost efficient and like a discount brand? All of what, you know, there's no right or wrong answer, but um, it really helps to sort of establish, you know, the identity of the brand, um, one, but then also, um, you know, if the messaging that you're putting out there has had an impact on um, actual consumer sentiment because you know ultimately I think that's one of the the best tests from a creative perspective is um, does the audience have a fundamental understanding of the message that we're trying to go, uh, get across do, do they understand what we are communicating as our key selling points um, and if not what exactly are we doing wrong? Yeah, yeah. And Aaron, are there any any go to methodologies or proxy metrics that you use? You like to pull out of your back pocket and use as a as a good measurement of awareness to performance or just an awareness impact? Yeah, and I I can't agree more with Ryan. I can't tell you how many times I say larger measurement solution in a meeting. Um, I love having um, you know lift studies or foot traffic studies to have in our back pocket. Um, used to run a lot of those like Nielsen online brand effect studies on some of the larger um, CPG brands a lot, and that's where we would optimize our buys to. But I think what's also important is we would also have larger measurement solutions that tied back to sales. So we would run a marketing mix model once a year, or once a quarter, or we would have sales lift studies. So um, we could kind of see how both of these metrics are performing, um, optimizing our campaigns to more of these uh, branding um, metrics, if you will, but also seeing how that impacts on kind of a lower funnel side. Um, but, you know, outside of these larger measurement solutions, I would say we look at, you know, branded search lift a lot, um, social listening sentiments just to see uh, as a proxy. Um, yeah, and foot traffic space, like I mentioned, to see if we're driving um, more um, footfall into key uh, retailers. Anything that you're doing, any anything like TV to, you know, yeah. off online type measurement that you are you're finding success with or you're finding very sexy right now in the in the space yeah i think too with all that said like the evolution of tech and just new solutions that are available in our industry is continuing to grow and one that we're um, doing right now which is really fun is tying um, tv attribution to um, like a install for an app um, so that's been really amazing to be able to kind of take more of this what traditionally would be awareness focused and, you know, mark it all the way down and give credit where credit's due um, when an app is installed. So love this space. It's always it's always innovating. Um, but yeah, it's amazing what what advanced analytics is really bringing to not only the camp, the campaigns that we're seeing today at generator, but also just the evolution of that over time. So Crystal, any, any, you know, go to analytics recommendations or, or proxy metrics that you love to use across your experience? Yeah, I think um, Ryan and Aaron definitely touched on the touched on them really between whether it's using search or brand health. Um, so I'm not going to like beat a dead horse on that. But what I will say is that once you have these great um, upper funnel kind of like um, metrics, um, it's like there's also looking at it from like a client side and having to bring those into like a board meeting. And so like you go and you say, hey, awareness improved from 43% to 60%. And there isn't this resounding like, yay. It's like, okay, but what about my, <laughs> like, it's like, but what about my sales? And so I think it's like when we are taking those, um, those results into meetings, just like how do we reframe those conversations? Um, because really you can rebuild an entire brand um, just off of something like a social listening. So um, one of the most famous brands um, to speak of is Domino's. Like Domino's did an entire rebrand because some, a lot of people online said, your pizza sucks and tastes like cardboard. And so with that information, they drove an entire, just like a reconsideration campaign. So this wasn't a conversion campaign, it was a reconsideration campaign just to get people to think differently about their brands. And then the sales after that followed. Um, so I think it's also just like reframing those conversations that we're having um, because those um, results may not be seen a few months or weeks. It may take a year or a year or two to feel those effects of those results. Um, so I think reframing the concept um, those conversation and then also managing the expectations when we are bringing these metrics um, and results to them, which are great metrics, but again, it doesn't tie directly to the bottom line. 
Sure. What do, I like the the boardroom idea because I have certainly been in those meetings, and and it's it is tying back to the right metric, to the right tactic, right, and understanding how everything works together. Um, there's actually a good question here about vendors or research companies that we have found that provide the most valuable information for brand awareness. So I know, Aaron and Ryan, you guys were just talking about you know, brand lift studies, foot traffic studies, any notable studies or, or, or third parties that we work with or you have worked with in the past that provide this very well? Yeah, I, I've worked with um, Melbourne Browns before I rise. Um, like I said, the Nielsen online brand effects study was a while ago. They probably changed the name. They change the name all the time. Um, I know Lucid had a, a pixel for a while that we would activate. So um, there's some big guys, but Melbourne Brown is probably one of the bigger ones um, that I've used, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, beyond the partners that Aaron just mentioned, which are uh, all ones that are definitely at the, the top of my list as well, um, Adelphic is is uh, really great, uh, especially for, for digital results um, from what I've seen. Um, and, you know, another partner that's out there that I haven't uh, got an opportunity to use yet, uh, but I know is doing great stuff in the analytics space is uh, Resonate. Nice. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've used some of their, their, uh, their third-party reporting. Well, this is wonderful. Um, I know that we're getting close to that 10 minute mark and I do want to just wrap us up with a little bit of punctuation in, in this topic of really brand awareness versus performance. And we've talked about many different things. We've talked about how the differences in a client life stage can impact this mix, how the specific brand's consumer journey to purchase affects that mix, and then also how to effectively and efficiently test and learn so that when we're looking at you know, different audiences or different vendors or different, you know, platforms, we're doing so efficiently and we're not just spending to spend. Um, and then lastly, measurement is incredibly important, right? In everything that we do, I mean, at Generator, it's one of our, one of our uh, mass pillars of everything that we do is data driven. And so that is definitely a testament of the work that we're doing every day. But I do want to just have you guys from a personal perspective, and I know I get witness to the great work that you all do on a daily basis. But, you know, Aaron, if you had one thing for people to take away from today, what what would be that that shining star to say, this is what Aaron said, I'm going into 2022 and I feel good about it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep it short and sweet and just say you have to plant seeds to harvest and branding is when you want a consumer to think or feel something new about your brand and performance is when you want to remind them of what they already know. So just keep that in mind. Crystal? I am going to blow up the title of this <laughs> of this um, panel discussion. I it's not a branding versus um, performance. Like it's a great way to frame up our conversation, but it's branding and um, performance. Mm -hmm. And so I think that understanding the role that both of these play um, within your brand, within that consumer journey, within the landscape, I think that is um, far more impactful than versus versus just focusing on whether it's just solely awareness or solely conversion. It's just understanding that there's such a strong interconnected um, relationship between the two um, and that to really not lose, lose sight of either one of them. Love that. And Ryan, what are, what are we thinking as your as your last punctuated point today? Well, since you've outed me as a data nerd, um, I think I'll stick with a measurement oriented. <laughs> I'll <laughs> for you forever. <laughs> there you go. But uh, yeah, what I would say is, um, you know, a, a lot of the points that we really brought up um, tie together the importance of establishing the right metrics. Um, and I think going back to the concept of, you know, like what you feel comfortable bringing into the boardroom, um, I think it's important to establish the role of each individual channel, um, maybe even on a line item by line item basis on a media plan, just understanding what the expected impact that a media tactic has, and then assigning it the right uh, KPI, because ultimately, KPIs are the translation of business objective to media metrics, right? We're optimizing towards media metrics, but ultimately it's to drive business objectives. So really the KPI, um, it, it's something that 
I think gets glanced over a bit at times. Uh, we sometimes get tunnel vision um, in order to just get things to market, but it almost functions as the Rosetta Stone between business objectives and media objectives. So just ensuring that um, we pay close attention to it and understanding um, you know, the difference between each channel and the role that it fulfills and the metrics that it will create. Absolutely perfect. So we have about eight minutes left in today's webinar, and I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I have some that have been pinged to me on the side here. So if you do have any questions on the phone or are listening in, feel free to use that chat function. Um, I saw that one had already come through that the team just answered. Um, but one of the ones that we have here, you know, how when it, if you're working with a small budget or if I'm working with a small campaign, how, how can we have this dialogue about awareness? You know, if I do have constrained dollars, obviously I want the biggest volume of sales or volume of leads for my buck. How would we recommend going about that? I mean, Aaron, I can, I can start off with you. Yeah, I think it's kind of what we've all been talking about is like reframing and like changing the arena or the battlefield that you're fighting in. So I know I've worked on brands that have spent less than three figures or six figures and then brands that are spending multi-million dollars like and those small brands can still do it um i think you just have to be a little bit more strategic with it um so it may not be this like large national play like i said you may need to select five markets and start testing your brand building in there or you may need to you know drop um and change your target from 65 plus to 55 plus like you don't want to swing all the way down to 18 year old you know you, you can make these small kind of strategic shifts um, to start testing and learning and building um, some of your branding. So I would just say it's it's definitely doable, but you may just need to kind of change the arena that you're fighting in. Perfect. Ryan, Crystal, any any other examples of, of how you can be uh, an, uh, providing awareness to your customer base with limited dollars? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, just um, Adding on to uh, what Aaron mentioned, which I completely agree with, um, you know, at the at the foundation of really what we do, it's um, finding the right target, finding the right audiences that that resonate most. So, just continuing to fine tune, um, home in specifically on where you see the strongest overall uh, brand results in metrics, and you know, continuing to really focus dollars there. Um, again, you're not going to drive a huge amount of reach with that, but that's never really been the goal. If the goal is to um, grow overall sales and to do so efficiently um you know it's it's more the matter of refining that target rather than you know trying to do um everything at once perfect perfect and then lastly the, another question has come in just understanding the longevity that a, a brand should expect so when you start doing these testing and, and learning strategies expanding into the upper funnel portions of your media campaigns, what should the timing expectations be in the short term and the long term for when these awareness dollars could be paying dividends? Yeah, um, and this is an area that um, I think um, truly kind of depends and especially depends on how new that brand is. Um, but I take, for example, a fairly a really a new brand um, that I've um, come across since I've worked um, at Generator and um, really that plan started in January and we didn't start to see a full uptick until May but for for us I think that was a, a really short time frame and you know time is relative but that's a short time frame for a brand that's really new that's coming to the table with a completely different value proposition and being able to see um, those sales upticks, um, sale uptick in May. And that uptick continued throughout the end of the year. And so where we started with a very heavy awareness focus because really there wasn't any awareness out there about the brand at all and even a lot of confusion about it between other brands and what people thought it was. Um, um, we saw that uptick starting in May and continue throughout the end of the year so that when we're moving into 2022, we don't have to spend as many of our dollars um, in those awareness tactics. We can scale back on it. Um, but I have worked on other um, larger CPB brand, CPG brands where it's really between that one year to three year mark. And a lot of times I've seen that it doesn't pay off until a year, um, year two or year three. Yeah, I would agree, especially in the CPG space. I feel like traditionally it's one to three years. You know, it takes time to build that reach and frequency and accumulate that with your consumer. 
Um, so again, I think it's just one of those situations where you have to be in lockstep with leadership and not your teams and just be patient, um, but still, you know, measure year over year. So you can start to see these like kind of small shifts and ticks up um, as well. Perfect. All right. So that is all the questions that we have. Um, I'm going to just do a quick closing, which which is I think that we've stressed the importance of understanding the full funnel. And I love the Crystal, what you said regarding it's not branding versus performance, it's branding and performance. And I think that overarching takeaway from today is absolutely how do they work together? How do you measure them internally and have that internal dialogue with your teams? And then also, what is how do you engage your unique consumer from a brand perspective in a way that is meaningful to them that will have that brand love conversation and really introduce them to what you're wanting to tell your story about. So again, thank you so much, Aaron, Ryan, and Crystal. You guys have been fantastic throughout this entire process. And again, thank you so much for everyone that's uh, that joined us today. This is recorded, so I'll be sending out the recording probably early next week. Um, you'll also be able to see all of this information, the content, the video, etc., on our website going forward. So thank you guys very, very, very much. And as we get into the holiday week, please have a very safe holiday week. Please enjoy your time with your family. And thank you so much for joining Rise and Set. Hope to see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.